Hospitals closed in a northeastern Chinese city due to the CCP virus pandemic, and in Beijing, medical staff are told to keep notices from authorities confidential. Two Chinese geniuses, a father and son, both lost their lives. One at the hands of the CCP's brutality three decades ago, the other by the virus this week. Unusually cold weather in China, a city worker was frozen to death on the street. Farmers suffer under snow and wind. A Chinese court sentenced 10 Hong Kong activists to up to three years in jail. They crossed the border illegally into mainland China when they fled from Hong Kong to Taiwan by sea. And the European Union and China approved an investment deal. The CCP has promised a lot, but can it keep its promise? Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. The pandemic is worsening in Xinjiang City, part of northeast China. The city entered a wartime state on Wednesday, similar to what's called a state of emergency in the U.S. For the past week, local authorities have announced handfuls of new virus cases daily. More than 10,000 people reportedly had close contact with the confirmed patients and are currently under quarantine. But locals tell us they believe the actual number of infections is far higher than official reports let on. Three medical staff members are among the official confirmed cases. Four medical institutions have since been closed. Patients cannot be hospitalized here. We're not allowed to accept them. No patients can be hospitalized now. Now the outpatient and emergency departments are closed. The lockdown applies to a number of neighborhoods in the city. Nearly 20,000 people are impacted. One tire repair shop owner spoke to our sister media, the Epoch Times, on Tuesday, saying he and other merchants located close to the shuttered neighborhoods have also been tested for the virus. He described being tested twice within a week. He says no one knows when the restrictions will be lifted. A citizen from Xinjiang who asked not to be named told us that now, once one person is infected, their whole family is sure to catch it, adding that many households are already sickened. He pointed out what the problem is in his view, saying none of the figures reported by the authorities are true. One Beijing citizen familiar with the issue told us the health commission of the city's Chaoyang district recently issued an emergency notice. It requires medical institutions to strengthen their confidentiality measures. Facilities were asked not to forward official notices to their families and friends via email or social media. Beijing now claims another source of the virus has been found, imported German car parts. Chinese state-run media outlets reported on Monday that the virus has been detected on imported parts inside a Mercedes car factory in Beijing. But some Chinese netizens are questioning how the virus survived the months-long trip overseas. Some of them wrote sarcastically that the virus must have followed strict orders from the Chinese Communist Party. Now we turn to Taiwan. The first case of a new strain of the CCP virus was found on the island over the weekend. It's the same variant now found in the UK. Taiwan's health minister announced on Wednesday a teenager returned from the UK on Sunday. He's since been diagnosed with the new variant of the virus. Minister Chen Shizhong said the teen had a fever when he arrived on the island and was immediately sent to the hospital. His condition is stable. The UK strain of the virus is believed to be more infectious than previous ones, but not deadlier. Another two passengers from the same flight were also diagnosed with the CCP virus, but they were not infected with the new variant. To help prevent further spread, Taiwan will restrict the entry of foreign travelers from January 1, 2021. The president of Taiwan's parliament called transparency the key to the success for epidemic prevention in Taiwan, adding that the country will show its democratic system is superior to the Chinese communist regime. That's because Beijing rules by brutality and coercion, while Taiwan embraces freedom and transparency. The island is located only about 100 miles from mainland China. Millions of people travel between the island and China every year. But despite the proximity, Taiwan only reported seven virus deaths and about 800 infections. Nearly one year ago, on the last day of 2019, Taiwan started to monitor passengers coming from Wuhan. It was part of prevention measures taken against virus spread. The same day, Taiwan also warned the World Health Organization of a highly contagious virus emerging in Wuhan. 
But at the time, Beijing authorities were busy silencing eight doctors turned whistleblowers from Wuhan. That's after they tried to warn their medical colleagues about the virus. China did not admit human-to-human -human transmission until three weeks later. Two generations of Chinese geniuses, a father and a son, died at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP. The father, a respected translator, was tortured to death during the Cultural Revolution. His son, a legendary pianist, managed to survive but could not overcome the CCP virus three decades later. NTD's Xu Wenhui has more on the story. Legendary Chinese pianist Fu Tsong passed away in the UK on December 28th. He died after weeks of hospitalization with the CCP virus. He was 86 years old. His father, Fu Lei, was one of China's most respected translators of French literature. His translation work on Jean Christophe by Roland has influenced generations of Chinese people. He faced severe persecution during China's Cultural Revolution, a time where the Communist Party sought to overhaul the country politically and culturally. Much of China's tradition was lost. Fu hung himself 34 years ago during the shift, 1966. Both generations of geniuses from the Fu family failed to escape the clutches of the Chinese Communist Party. One senior commentator in Taiwan let out a sign upon hearing the news of Fu Tsong's death. Fu Tsong fled to the UK from Poland at age 24. According to the commentator Lin Baohua, the decision was made as a family, meaning his parents were ready to sacrifice themselves to keep their son safe. The couple asked their son to stay out of China. That's because they expected even more trouble in the future, as they saw the regime's tyranny as an enemy to humankind. At that time, Fu Tsong was already a famous pianist. Throughout his life, he always followed his father's example, working to be an upright, virtuous person as his top priority. But the CCP's cultural revolution ramped up in the 60s and 70s. Its true intentions began to reveal themselves, namely to eliminate Chinese traditional culture and those who embrace it. Many who failed to escape didn't survive. Soon after the suicide of Fu Tsong's father, another renowned pianist also killed herself, similarly due to the regime's persecution. To this day, many Chinese people say the nature of the CCP has never really changed and is simply hidden. Commentator Lin took Taiwan's success in controlling the pandemic as an example. Many say Taiwan's achievement in fighting the CCP virus came due to the island's professionalism. But according to Taiwan newspaper Liberty Times, who cited Lin, the country's professionalism involves another important aspect. That's Taiwan's clear understanding of the CCP. The perspective has led its government not to trust Beijing or the World Health Organization, known to have ties to China. Lin concluded happiness only exists when people are aware of the danger brought by the regime and denounce it. Reporting by Xu Wenwei, NTD News. One year ago today, a Chinese doctor tried to send out a warning about a new virus that could transmit between humans. He was silenced by Chinese police and later died from the virus. Today, December 30th, is the one-year anniversary of Chinese whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang warning friends about a potential contagious virus on social media chatting groups. The doctor from Wuhan posted the lab test result of a virus patient, writing seven cases of SARS have been confirmed in the market, and the patients were isolated in the emergency department of our hospital. Please tell your families to take preventative measures. SARS is a type of coronavirus that caused a pandemic in 2003. At midnight the same day, Dr. Li Wenliang was summoned by the Chinese police for what they call spreading rumors online. A few days later, Dr. Li was asked to sign a document that read, We want you to cooperate with the police and listen to our reminder and stop the illegal act. Can you do that? Li wrote, I can. Chinese state media ask people to not believe in these conspiracy theories or spread any rumors. On January the 3rd, Beijing issued an internal document to local authorities, ordered all institutions to destroy virus samples and forbade them from publishing any relevant research papers or lab results without official permission. From January the 6th to the 17th, Wuhan authorities did not report a single case of virus infection. Chinese authorities did not admit there were human-to-human -human transmission until January the 20th. Li has since become a glaring symbol of the Chinese regime's systemic cover-up. The 34-year-old whistleblower doctor later died from the virus on February the 7th. Penny Zhou, NTD News.
Now we look to reports of unusually cold weather in China. The country's meteorological observatory predicts the temperature in most parts of central and eastern China will drop significantly. From Monday to Thursday, temperatures are expected to plunge by about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, while some areas will see drops of around 29 degrees. The lowest temperature prediction set to strike north China could reach as low as negative 40 degrees. While in Beijing, the lowest temperature expected is around 8 degrees. Many of the country's eastern coastal regions have already seen snowfall this year, sometimes joined by strong winds. Schools are closed in some of these regions. Chinese media reported that a 56-year-old city worker in the eastern province of Shandong was frozen to death while sweeping in the streets in the early morning. But by the time an ambulance arrived, he showed no signs of life. Elsewhere, an online video shows a chicken farmer who is an elderly woman kneeling down to pray in Jiangsu province along the southern coast. That's because thousands of the young chickens she was raising had been frozen to death. The clip shows the roof covering of the chicken cook had been broken and blown open. A Chinese court sentenced 10 Hong Kong activists to up to three years in jail for illegally crossing the border. The case has drawn international attention and concern over the defendant's treatment. The group all had faced charges in Hong Kong from last year's protests and were traveling away from the city when they were intercepted on August 23rd, allegedly en route to self-ruled Taiwan. They have been held virtually incommunicado in a mainland Chinese prison since then. A court in the Chinese city of Shenzhen just over the land border with Hong Kong found eight of the defendants guilty of illegally crossing the border and sentenced them to seven months in jail and a fine of over $1,500. Two more were also found guilty of organising the crossing and faced two and three years in jail. The court said all 10 had pled guilty to their crimes. After the verdicts were announced, Hong Kong police said that two minors in the groups, now aged 17 and 18, had been handed over and would appear in court in Hong Kong after completing quarantine for coronavirus. The mainland prosecutor said they would not be charged after the two minors had willingly admitted to their guilt. However, Hong Kong police said they may face additional charges when they return home. Rights group Amnesty International expressed concern over the safety of the defendants in the mainland prison system. Family appointed lawyers were denied access to their clients and their government appointed lawyers were not available for comment. A former lawmaker from Hong Kong's Democratic Party was arrested on Monday. He was taken in by the city's anti-corruption agency and charged with disclosing the identity of a police commander. The police officer was involved in a violent attack at a local train station last year during Hong Kong's anti-Chinese Communist Party protests. The former lawmaker named Lam Cho Ting denies committing a crime, saying he was only investigating police misconduct, including suspected collusion between the police and criminal gangs. He also accused the anti-corruption agency of becoming a tool for the Chinese communist regime used to suppress dissent. Lam uploaded video footage to his Facebook account, showing officials arriving at his house to arrest him. Despite all of China's human rights abuses, think concentration camps in western China or live organ harvesting. And forget it try to cover up the virus before it spread around the world. China and the European Union have agreed on a new investment deal that doesn't say anything about slave labor. Negotiations started in 2013 and the deal is backed by every EU country. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the details. The European Union has agreed in principle to an investment deal with China. It would give the EU more access to the Chinese market. We spoke to a trade specialist. He says China has ignored its labour rights agreement and not everyone wins with this deal. Those who are losing a clear, it's Chinese dissidents, it's Chinese workers, it's Chinese religious minorities in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Inner Mongolia and elsewhere. China has not made any substantive offer to move forward with its commitments under any international treaty. It's a year to the day that China arrested the guy who tried to warn the world around COVID. He says that the European Commission kept this deal as far away from the European Parliament as possible, and Parliament members are the ones accountable to voters. And uh, in my experience, when governments are keen to keep deals away from Parliament, 
It's normally because they're afraid, not uh, open to the scrutiny. He says for now China has escaped punishment for not complying with basic human rights. There's going to come a day when we're going to have to take action against China. And my view and the view of many of those I speak to is that that time has come. Armstrong believes that some in Biden's team would keep tough on China. Look no further than his national security adviser, Jake Sullivan's tweets. He was clear. The EU should delay this decision. It should wait. It should look to strengthen Atlantic and Alliance. And it should work with the US to tackle and to take on China. He says that China has averted any commitment that could bring it up before any international court and be forced to testify. For the moment, it won't have to justify its human rights abuses against the Chinese people. Reporting from London, Patrick Hayden, NTD News. The U.S. takes steps to monitor China's water exploitation of a major river in order to protect countries further downstream. But almost at the same time, Beijing launches a new huge dam project that places India next in line to see its impact. And he's Xu Wenhui has the story. More and more countries are feeling the effects of China's manipulation of natural flowing water. The communist regime targets rivers that have upstream flow in China and downstream flow in other countries. India is likely to be the next, since China is planning to build dams upstream on a major river that flows through India. This is not new. Countries alongside the Mekong River have suffered at the hands of China for years. Mekong is one of the world's longest rivers. The 2,700-mile waterway known as Lansong in China originates in Tibet and flows south through Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. It is a life source for 60 million people. Taking its geographical advantage, China has a history of manipulating Mekong water and has built many dams on the river where it flows through the country. The dams bring disaster to downstream countries. Now the U.S. has stepped forward to counter Beijing's behavior. Earlier this month, December 14, the U.S. launched its Mekong Dam Monitor project. The state-funded project uses satellites to track water levels and detect surface wetness at Chinese dams on the river. The information is already made available to the public in near real time, starting from December 14. Researcher Brian Eiler from Stimson Center says the data shows China's dams are designed only for maximum power generation, without any consideration of the impact on downstream countries. A study by Eyes on Earth, which is part of the Mekong Dam Monitor Project, said water had been held back in 2019 as other countries suffered severe drought. When the water level was expected to be at around 24 feet, 7.5 meters, the indicator showed the water level reached just 8 feet, 2.5 meters. Cracked riverbeds were exposed during what should have been an abundant fishing season. This past August, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said on Twitter, quote, China's massive dams are manipulating flows in a non-transparent manner that harms Mekong countries, end quote. And not only Mekong countries, China's water exploitation is set to impact India. In late November this year, China officially confirmed its plan to implement hydropower exploitation in the Yarlong Tsangbo River. Its planned power generation is triple that of the Three Gorges Dam, which is already the world's biggest hydroelectric dam in terms of production. And the project will be implemented during a five-year period from 2021 to 2025. The river originates at Angxi Glacier in western Tibet. Chinese state-owned hydropower company Power China signed the so-called Strategic Cooperation Agreement with the Tibet Autonomous Region Government last month. When constructed, this will be the first downstream dam on the lower reaches of the Yarlong Tsangbo River, or Brahmaputra River as it is known in India. The river flows into the Indian Ocean in Bangladesh and is the economic lifeline for many South Asian countries. India has expressed concerns. Dr. Jaganath P. Panda, a research fellow from New Delhi-based Indian Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA, told Radio Free Asia that for many years China has been selective when sharing hydrological information. He said China even refused to provide information when China-Indian relations were in tension. Radio Free Asia also cites Farwa Amar, the director of the South Asia Program of East-West Institute, EWI, a U.S.-based global think tank. She worries China's dam construction may directly affect the agricultural economy and natural ecology of downstream countries. South Asian countries have been deeply anxious about the risk, especially if China weaponizes the river. 
Reporting by Xu Wanwei, NTD News. And that's all for today's China In Focus. Thanks for watching and see you tomorrow.